Hello, and welcome to another Market Muse Content Strategy Webinar. I'm your host and the co-founder, Chief Product Officer of Market Muse, Jeff Boyle, and today's discussion is focused on putting the right content into the right vehicle at the right time. Maximizing your content's mileage is about repurposing as a practice. Before I introduce our special guest today, you know, typical housekeeping if you've been here before. First, ask us anything about conversational marketing, lead funnels, non-funnels, as we'll get to, SEO, content strategy, you name it, in the chat box. If it gets into the flow of the discussion, if it's you know a fit, we're going to answer it as it goes. If not, we'll get to it in our Ask Me Anything session in the Content Strategy Collective Slack group in the half hour to hour that follows the discussion. Second, pretty easy follow-up. Sign up for that Slack group. There's a link here. You'll get to it right around a thousand elite content strategists and SEOs talking shop all the time. Last, the recording will be sent to you in the next few days. And when you get that, go check out the near on 50 or so content strategy webinar recordings we have from superstars like Kevin Indig, Andy Crestedina, Paul Rotzer and I just did one on artificial intelligence and natural language generation. So go check those out, download a few of them, shoot me a note at jeff at marketmuse.com and we'll set you up a content strategy session. All right, enough of the housekeeping. She's the vice president of marketing for Drift. She's the champion for the voice of the customer and everything she does and advocates for. Kate Adams, thanks for joining us today. Jeff, thanks so much for having me. I was really excited to get the invite and happy that you guys squeezed me into your hectic schedule here. <laughs> oh, you know, sometimes with the virtual events and the webinars, it seems like there's too many, but there's not. It's really wonderful, especially when you can do the recordings and we can follow them up with Ask Me Anything. You really can get some exclusive access to people who you wouldn't normally. And we really thank you for joining us. Drift is one of our favorite businesses. We're Drift customers. Shameless plug, right? Um, always, always thankful to have you as a customer, Jeff. <laughs> also, Drift Live, Drift Intel, Drift Everything. Live View is my is my favorite thing. Ask the, ask my internal team; they laugh about it all the time. I must say, Live View a million times. But enough about that, right? I wanted you to kind of give us a little bit of background in you, how you got started with Drift, and also I was just looking at the Revenue Teams document. Tell us the story of that and how it relates to repurposing. Yeah, absolutely. So my background, so for those folks that aren't familiar with Drift, Drift is a revenue acceleration platform. So we bring conversational marketing and conversational sales together to do what is most important for any business, which is drive net new revenue and as well as protect the current revenue you have. And so I, I've been at Drift for just about a year and nine months now. And I before joining here, I was actually a Drift customer and loved the product so much that I realized I had to work here. And so I'm VP of marketing here. I lead up the demand gen function on our marketing team here at Drift and, and really, really excited to be here. So yeah, you talked about, we recently published an ebook and we're here to talk about repurposing content, right? So we wrote an ebook with our friends at Clary. The, it's called the go-to-market playbook for revenue teams. And so I met Jeff, geez, Jeff, it must be almost a year ago at this point. And we were geeking out about repurposing content. I like to think about it as squeezing the lemon and, and making sure that we, you get all the juice out of it. And so we took uh, that ebook. The ebook wasn't published yet. We took the outline of that ebook, created a webinar that we did. We got over 400 folks registered for, got, took that outline took the content from the ebook that was unpublished, presented it on a webinar, and then used that webinar to build up demand for the actual ebook itself. And then now we're using the ebook in our paid content, paid advertising content strategy there. And then we've also go and take that content from the webinar. And we've actually picked that up and put it down in a number of different presentations that we give, similar to these ones and, and others talking about revenue acceleration and revenue teams and exactly how you move from alignment of your revenue team to actioning that revenue team together, breaking down those silos and, and all of that good stuff. So, I mean, that is one example of how we've taken really all that content, all that hard work. And it, and it kills me, Jeff and I were talking about it as we were, were waiting to get started here. It kills me to see marketers, great marketers, 
bend over backwards, do so much acrobatics to create an ama amazing content like that, and then just to let it all go in that one single format. And, and so then we took the webinar content and we wrote a summary blog post about it, right? So now we're talking about like one ebook that's become a webinar, that's become multiple presentation decks, that's become an ebook, that's become all of these, uh, that's become many blog posts over time for us. And so that's how we like to think about it is like, are we, how much juice are we squeezing there? Yeah, I'm making those huge investments and I think that that's really the definition of kind of content repurposing. It's it's how do you how do you make sure that during the entire phases of building that content, you're thinking about how to squeeze that extra juice out. And you know when you're doing and planning that, is that after the fact for you, or are you including ideas for and other things you definitely want to do from a vehicle promotion formats? Are you doing that during the process or you just kind of post playing results out of the kind of that end game that someone else made we're doing that during our planning process so we have a pretty tight integrated campaigns planning process where on a quarterly basis we identify what the key themes are for our key personas that we want to be talking about throughout that quarter and then we're identifying okay what are the offers that we want to do within that quarter and so that example that i gave on the the go-to-market playbook for revenue teams is exactly an example of that, right? Where it was, we we had the theme of revenue acceleration that we wanted to talk about to sales and marketing professionals. And then the offers team came together after those themes were defined and we wrote the narratives as they related to those themes and said, what are the core offers? And out of that one ebook, again, we got four different offers out of that one thing. No, that's a great point. So it's not just the you know post publish and i think a lot of times what you get is somebody trying to do it after the fact so you've added kind of now hey what can we turn into a machine and we'll get into the kind of that integrated playbooking thing where have you been the most successful at publishing and, and repurposing what phases or what things where does it have the most impact i you think most bang for your buck as far as that goes i love the idea of doing multiple audiences because you can have one ebook, you can have one download, you know, gated item that has many audience that has different messaging. It's actually a better customer experience for you to customize that. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that's exactly what you want to do as it relates to advertising too, right? Which is like, we take that one ebook and we're running anywhere from five to 10 different variations of the ad based on the audience that we're showing that ad to, as well as based on just different, we're trying to find out what what's the ad text that's gonna resonate the most. And so that's really key and core to, to how we do it. As it relates to like where, what phases in the, I think if we're talking about phases of the customer journey, I think it's really all around what kind of content you're creating there. So we really want to think about, does this content, is this content really for like our top of funnel folks mm -hmm. that are really just starting to educate themselves on the problems that they have? Or is this more like middle funnel content, right? That is, as people are getting into researching how they're going to solve that problem, all of the ways in which they could potentially solve that problem, or is it really bottom of the funnel content where it's somebody has identified that we're the solution that they want to go with, but they now need to justify it, right? They're trying to understand the ROI of that, all of those things. And so that's how we kind of bake that in. No, the, and you're right. It's like, the, it's the small lift content and like the big, big lift, small lift. If you can go small lift on a middle of the funnel or maybe a consideration phase item to morph it into a awareness phase interpretation or position, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the, we have to force it to be more than just social media posts and promos. You know, the investment in high quality content is just too high. You know, so I think forcing your team, it sounds terrible when I say force your team. Force the, you know, what was the other word? Give them ideas that maybe take two or three great ideas or take two or three parts of the funnel that this article could go to. You know, regardless of what phase of the buy cycle you're in or phase of the content cycle you're in, let's say at the end of that process, if at the idea phase, at the research phase, at the briefing stage, if the editor gets some input, this could also be that. This, for a small lift, 
we could turn this into a quick blog post like you mentioned well now we've got dozens of potential items so you could turn that into a machine and you know i, I think that's really awesome because you know are you you know this this slide says you know are you losing out on potential customers you know if you don't make that awareness phase what what problems could you run into right yeah absolutely i mean so i think you want to think about it at the top of the funnel you you started to kind of dig into there right which is like okay i always think about it kind of from the top down so like what what's keeping the folks that i want to reach up at night right what are the what are the things that are that, that you're just worried about that the things that you keep that you, that keep you up at night typically you're googling and so <laughs> that Google search data is so key and integral for us on, on the topics that we need to be writing about, obviously, right? And then from there, then we start to think about, okay, great. So how do we educate them that this is a problem, that they do have a problem and what that problem actually is and dig deep in, into that phase. And also from an awareness perspective, like what is the really sexy name of that ebook or a sexy headline that's going to get somebody's attention, right? So one of our most successful content pieces is the MQL is dead, right? Highly controversial for folks that I want us to be talking about to demand gen marketers like myself, right? And anything is dead. You could pretty much tack it onto anything and it typically does well because if you take a polarizing stance, people tends to resonate or at least get people's attention, right? And so then from there, I, th I start to think about like, okay, great. How, how am I convincing them that this is a problem, educating them that they have a problem and then educating them that there is a better way, right? Mm -hmm. And that there are solutions to their problems. And then once, once I help them understand that they have solutions, how do I help them understand which way to go, what the value of all those solutions are and what they need to look out for as it relates to all those solutions, right? Yeah. And and then from there, I now I now I have helped you understand what those solutions are. But how now am I going to help you understand like which one is the right one for you, which one you should pick or select? And so that that really gets into like ROI analysis, ROI calculators, ty all types of like self service tools, assessment tools, all of those types of tools that 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 we've built here and and are tremendous tremendously helpful throughout our entire funnel. You know, that, that consistent messaging and the voice of the customer, I mean, in lead magnets, it's key. And, and you know, like people learn and consume in different ways, like you mentioned, and on different channels, you know, video, audio, community-based, like getting your messaging inside of some sort of community, social paid, you know, even getting into, you know, silly things, you know, like print and airplane banners, you know, but hey, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're digesting that content differently and they'll respond to different types of message. Some of it branded, unbranded, you know, nurturing, educational, like you mentioned, or, you know, their actual business problem. You know, I'm solving that with an ROI, so ROI self-assessment, maturity model, and all those things are here. The interesting thing I'll point out, and I'm interested in your, your take on this is, but this is very hard for a typical person who's, only thinking about search engine optimization, you know, and, and so where do you see the dynamic of repurposing working against you if you are only thinking about it from a search engine optimization perspective? Yeah, because from an SEO perspective, all the SEOs that I know will tell you like, oh my gosh, duplicate content, you're going to have such an issue. But like the thing that, that cannot fundamentally be true at the same time is that if brand is like the same thing over and over and over and over again, right? Like that's that's really what executes brand is like, oh my gosh, this the these folks are amazing. They're doing incredible work, and you and you start to say it over and over and over again until and that's precisely what we did with the category of conversational marketing, right? Conversational marketing didn't exist four years ago, and and now. We have, there are so many vendors in the space that are now calling themselves conversational marketing, uh, platforms, tools, et cetera. And that's really when you know you nailed it, right? But that that's what brand and category building really is, is reciting that over and over and over again. Whereas like an SEO will tell you like, no, this page is for this and this content is for this. But there's tons of value in that repurposing. You, you're, S the SEO is correct in that, yes, don't write the same thing over and over word for word, right? But there's a million different ways to say the same thing. And so you can still do that. 
and you have to have those two things tie hand in hand. Let's see, it's, it's so dogmatic. It's so passe to think, you know, there's so much, and we, we should write keyword cannibalization is dead, by the way, You're, we're kind of talking about, because, you know, the, the, the insanity is it's quite ridiculous in today's world. I mean, how can you possibly think that it's one word to one page for your business? How is that possibly going to allow you to meet the buyers on their grounds, where they are in the funnel, where they are in their level of maturity, if you're only allowed to write one page, what is this magic page, right? Yeah, absolutely. But also think about it from a long tail perspective, from an SEO perspective, right? Which is like, that's the, that's a perfect use of repurposing, right? Because now you're talking about those keywords for that specific industry or the longer tail versions of those keywords or different variations of those keywords that you can start to write about and, and be and beef up that content as you go repurpose it, right? Right, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's the stage, it's the medium, it's the pain point, what you mentioned eloquently and that's not often thought about, is very rarely the keyword, is it? It's often, it's what the value is. Are you exhibiting your expertise? Are you keeping the brand message? Are you doing it with various types of content? You know, what other things have you seen kind of converting? You know, you, you mentioned some tools and some lead magnets, what have you seen out of that's kind of outside of the, outside of the box that we've that you've been creating or repurposing into recently? Yeah, so uh, a lot of the stuff that that we repurpose into, so we've talked a lot about. So I have this whole concept of a, a bit of a different funnel, right? Which is our funnel. I think demand gen marketers, too many of them, content marketers, all all marketers probably in general. We have. If, you, if you'll bear with me here, I'm going to use this as a, a made up verb, but we've acronymized pretty much everything. So we've got MQLs, SQLs, SQOs, TOFU, MOFU, BOFU, CRMs, MAPs, like everything is an acronym, right? Like everything is an acronym. And we have really forgotten that these aren't just acronyms or three letters that we're putting into our other three letters. These aren't MQLs we're putting into CRMs, it's Jeff. And Jeff is here because he wants to understand, educate himself on something or or like fix a problem that he has, right? And, and it's our job to help Jeff and facilitate that conversation. Like a uh, bold statement, like your job as a marketer, whatever discipline within marketing is to help help people have conversations. That's what we're here for, right? How can you enable conversations, enable the conversation for the first time, and then keep that conversation going until that person is actually ready to make a purchasing decision, right? And then even then, after they've made a purchasing decision, enable that conversation with your customer base. How are things going? Where, where do you need help? How else can we help you? Do you know that we can to help you solve this problem as well? Like, right, all of these uh, other conversations. And so really, we think about that from, from in terms of repurposing it on like, so that human funnel kind of thing, it, it came the first time it was on a podcast, right? It was, we, we launched that on a po podcast. And then from there, we put it into a blog post. And from there, we wrote an ebook on it, which is the MQL is dead. So like, all of those things came together, but we're thinking about it like, great, how can we use this for brand? How do we use, again, how do we use this as awareness? Then how do we use this? Like, and, and what I love what you said, which is like the modes that people learn in or want to consume content are all wildly different. Some people want to put their earbuds in and go out for a run and that's how they consume kind of educational content, right? That at least the first half of my run, I'm always listening to a podcast to, to help myself get better, right? Physically and mentally at the same time, a little killed two birds with one stone. And then it's, and then, but maybe other people like much would rather prefer to like sit down and read something like and just churn that out and go through it. Whereas other people may be highly visual and like the video, a video is really the right realm for them. But my question to every content marketer out there is like, if you, if you have this great concept and you published it in this lead bank that you, that you had in an ebook and you didn't do anything else with it, you got a 10th of the value that you really could get out of that. Because that ebook and the content you're using should be in the next presentation you're giving. Yeah. I mean, you've hit it so on the money. It's, it is one tenth is kind. One tenth mm -hmm. of me. 
Yeah. And you know, for me, I have a really hard time reading anything, right? I have to listen to it. And, and so, you know, like ask yourself, you know, what if you knew, like thinking about ABM, right? I love uh, you talking about some of the ABM work that you're doing, but when you're talking about ABM, what if you knew that that person that you're targeting, that ICP, you know, that ideal customer pro, another acronym, right, by the way, uh, you know, what if that ideal customer profile only consumed audio and you've never published an audio piece, right? You're stuck. I mean, you, you, that, that's a great example. Like if you knew explicitly the medium and the format that they liked, you know, you've got to check off all those boxes. I, I like, always like, the, you, you kind of mentioned this before, but like rich media, your wins, your, you know, the wins that you've had as a business, gated content, stuff that's behind a reg wall now, and then stuff you spent a lot of money on. Those are my four horsemen of repurposing. You've got to get, go through those four and you're going to find the ones that you didn't squeeze the juice out of. And, you know, gated content was one that you talked about. And if you do that marathon session, try to get yourself into those 50 possible mediums and types and repurpose odd, you know, repurpose things. And, you know, like you mentioned conversational marketing in the content strategy. You kind of talk about it two different ways that I had a question. How much of that is literally <laughs> conversations or how much of that is you modeling conversations that you kind of have in the, in the marketing space? Yeah. So a couple of things that, that struck me too, and, and you mentioned ABM and mm -hmm. there's something else that we do for our ABM accounts, which is like, we will actually create a juiced up version of that content for those ABM accounts. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's not SEO value, it's campaign value. So I will go and put, the logo of our ABM accounts on an ebook and have my SDR and sales rep reach out to strategic people that we want to have conversations with in that account. And we will do that all day long. But that's again, like, and, and think about that. It's not a heavy lift. I can, I, we created a template pretty easy. It's easy to jump, to dump in that logo file on it and just ship it and convert it to a PDF. That is very simple to do, and you're leaving money on the table when you're not doing those things. You're creating industry-specific content. How are you not doing that for every single ABM account that you care about in that industry? I, like, I just don't, you're just leaving money on the table for yourself, which is, is crazy to me. Yeah, I, I, kind of, we were talking about this before, but it's, it's you just got to do it not talk about it. I, I with, with repurposing, it's so easy to say, yeah, we're going to get the, with the, the transcript and then we're going to annotate it and then we're going to repurpose it into this thing. You really have to actually do it to see the benefit. I mean, it, it's a laugh, but I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are, they, they wish they were doing this stuff until you do it and see how easy it is. You'll never do it. It just feels yeah. like, oh, man, I've got to do 50 things for one content item. That seems like a lot. And then you look at it and you're like, wait a second. I, I might have invested a thousand dollars or 2000 or 5,000 in this object. And I'm only going one, I'm got one one-to-one -one value for it when I could have gotten five, 10, 30 times the value out of it. It just becomes a no brainer for your marketing investments, you know? And you also said something about repurposing with conversational marketing. I mean, I make, you know, drift videos, <laughs> you know, if I see someone on the site, if I see someone on the site that, you know, I know that we're, you know, is in our funnel or in our pipeline. Now, you're probably going to get a video, a very quick video that highlights, you know, why we think your pain point is a special one from us. And, you know, what other types of things? Your video is key, right? That's one of your guys' push. Yeah, definitely. So video is incredibly important for us on a number of different fronts. So there's Drift Video where the, where we have that one, you can do it one-to-one -one or one-to-many. And, and that's a prospecting tool that you can use. But then we also use video. We have a huge library of video in Insider, which we always create, right? And so that's another whole avenue that, that like I left off of there. But you can no longer afford as a content marketer to ignore video, right? YouTube is now the largest search engine that there is surpassing Google itself now. So if you're not posting video content, about your content, you're missing the mark. The other, the other big piece there I, I would think about is, so video's important. You had talked about before conversational marketing as part of your, in, into your content strategy. So 
as well as like that lead magnet magnet and you talked about gated content so gated content let me be clear none of my content's gated i run advertisements on those ebooks and you can read all of that on my web on my website on the web page of the actual book the book i just told you about about the go to market uh playbook for revenue teams like test me go to drift.com slash books right now go find that book on the first page click into it you will see all of that content completely ungated and what you'll find is that what you'll find there is that the only the bot asks you for your email address if you want to receive the pdf it's just for ease of use right it's for ease of use for the user because not too many people want to read an ebook on in a web format the other thing that we do quite a bit is we'll embed some of our eBooks into, into what we call conversational content pages. So it's the PDF of that book and you're scrolling through it, but on the right, there's Drift. And here's the thing, let me ask this question because I always ask myself this question as a marketer. I had all these people downloading these PDFs and it was all well and good, but then, then the problem became great they're they're downloading the pdf and i don't know what they're doing with it if they ever read it if if what if they had questions when they read it what then they had this like stale pdf format but now as somebody is consuming the content and they have a question for you or as they're consuming your content and they want to start a conversation with you it's as easy as clicking into that chat and being able to have a conversation right there right and so now like i don't have those fundamental questions on like hey what's happening here with that content or as somebody's consuming it uh, there's always somebody right there that i know can answer the question for them yeah you your it, it just empowers your you know your conversation whoever's having that conversation whether it's a sales rep whether it's a if, if whatever your bdr sdr function is or a marketer if they know what content the person is reading if they know where in the content they are and what that next step is what's that upgrade it's infinitely more powerful to a savvy kind of problem solving rep if they're stuck in plopping templates you know, you're going to have, you're not getting much of an advantage with that. But if you've got Absolutely. someone who can think on their feet and they're asking, oh, you know, you're, they're thinking to themselves, oh, they're, they're on page six of the MQL is dead guide. This is likely what they want to know. And how much more powerful are you? Yeah, I mean, the folks on my team who are in chat, like the, they open up that conversation with those folks saying like, hey, are you having, having some challenges with your MQLs? Right, because we all know it as marketers. What's the problem with MQLs? Well, problem is like marketing always thinks they have no problem delivering enough of them, and sales always says there's not enough of them, and they stink, right? And yeah. they're not of good quality, and that's the back and forth that that's constantly going on within within those things. But imagine if you can really have a like, hey, struggling with MQLs, like that that opener, that context is so uh, insightful as a conversation starter, right? And again. Your job as a marketer is to is to start and enable conversations throughout the life cycle. Yep, exactly. And you know, for for us, it's you know, when's the last time you completed a content inventory? You know, how frequently are you updating content? You know, these are concepts where if you have that problem, you're like, ah, not as much as I want to be, or I do one every year. You know, those are the pains. I mean, that's the yeah. oh man, I wish I could do more. I wish. I wish I knew where my strengths and weaknesses were. You know, where do you have gaps in, in topic coverage? You know, like, oh, I don't even know. You know, so you can ask these really poignant questions at the moment where someone's researching that concept. It's that be meet them at their time. Don't meet them at the time that fits into your marketing campaign, which is the very that's where you're downloading something. You know, then you're contacting them. Then you're hoping they respond. You're hoping all this response. Well, if you're doing it at the same at the time when they're thinking it, I mean, your chances of converting are just dramatic. And I think that. I mean, I one of my favorite quotes is like, "Hope is not a strategy." Let's be clear: hope is not a strategy, right? So, like, how do you get out of that? Mm -hmm. Oh no, that's straight. How do you make sure you're efficient though with this? Like, you know, you have you were talking about the marketing campaign infrastructure. How do you make sure that you're efficient with all these steps and? You know that your team is mature enough to get it done they have the right staff on hand or you know that just the left hand you know like we talked about 
the content team, the demand gen team, the SEO team are, are actually you know working in unison to make it all happen. How do you do that? That's really where we bring that like campaign campaign planning process together, where we are literally like we have a very structured set of of pro very structured process we follow, which is like step one is the brainstorm meeting, right? And that is with primarily like the, the marketing leadership team, where we talk about like our comms person comes in and talks about like what she's hearing in the market, like what are the current trends, what are the headlines, what's getting the news, right? Our the somebody from my team who who runs campaigns for us comes in and talks about okay for the last quarter these were the most successful things these were the things that flopped here's where we should double down here's where where we should like vacate digital team comes in and does the same thing like these were the offers that resonated really well on digital we should do more of this less of that right mm -hmm. and we walk through and so now once we've grounded ourselves and what's happening in our walls what's happening outside of walls then we come in and we and we start to talk about okay cool what are those key themes that we should be talking about and we walk out of that meeting with those themes defined and from there we hand those themes off to product marketing and say hey we need you to write narratives on these align them to, to the persona and help us understand what of what component in these themes does each of those personas care about specifically right and start to think about it from a real journey perspective. So like the demand gen marketer is thinking about X as it relates to this, Y as it relates to this, and Z as it relates to that, right? And drawing those lines for us. And then from there, we have a narrative review meeting, which is, again, that, that leadership, that planning team that comes back together and says, yep, rubber stamp these, these are good to go. We're, we're happy with the, where these narratives are at. And from there we do a handoff, right? And this is where it goes to the broader team. And this is where the broader web creative team gets involved. The broader content team gets involved. The broader demand gen team gets involved. All of the, the broader team really gets involved and they say like, okay guys, these are our themes. Mm -hmm. What are the key offers that we should develop within these themes, right? And they do that autonomously. And that's where a lot of the content repurposing is is going on and that is the process I alluded to earlier when we were talking about the go to market playbook for revenue teams where they came up with like you know George on my team was like great I'll do the webinar with Clary for that Gail was like and we're going to write the play the ebook for that and Jana who runs the event side was like great and then we're going to have an internet intimate ABM conversation with marketing and sales leaders to talk about the concept of revenue teams and we'll highlight a customer right pulled all those things together and then then, then they come back to the broader leadership team and say, "Hey, hey, here's what we've, here's what we're proposing. We do on the offers is how many of we may have. Here's how they look out, look out across the quarter, and then we, you know, have a discussion there. And the objective there is to rubber stamp that, and the team's off and running. And so that's really done a month and a half, two months and two months prior to the to that quarter even starting." Wow, um, that's amazing, and what a process. I've got a really great question, which I'll get to, but I did wanna highlight, how do you ensure that that gets into your sales team's hands in the appropriate, with the appropriate kind of intelligence and in when to use it from a sales enablement perspective? And I know that's a constant challenge for any team, and we can talk in more details of that, but how do you make sure they know when to use these vehicles or these, these media? Yeah, so, we are we're we have a regular cadence of meetings with the sales team it's every two weeks and i we rarely talk about anything that's greater than a month out it has to be of really enormous significance for us to be talking about anything that's greater than a month out for sales just because they're always worried about like what can i use today what can i do today like how am i you know like I, I don't care about what's going on next month. I, I have stuff to do now. And so from there, we're always highlighting, hey, this is the stuff that you care about. I want you to go to, I, I want you to promote rev growth because it's a value added event that's completely free and every single one of your prospects and opportunities is going to care about it. Oh, I want you to highlight this, the revenue team's ebook, right? Because it's just 
published last month, and it talks about the, our brand new category on revenue acceleration, but goes a level deeper to help people understand how to actually execute revenue acceleration and what a revenue team is and what the members of it are. And, and that's the stuff that we're highlighting. We also use Highspot for enablement too, in order to make sure that that the the sales team has a good grip on all of the things that are available to them and when they should use it and for whom. No, I love that idea. So it's it's, it's really the the triangle you talk about was you have a sales enablement platform. Some people can kind of afford that investment. Some people cannot, but definitely look into those. The other is every every salesperson should be able to know the push this now and the push this why. Mm-hmm. And that, you said that it is like. This is the thing everyone cares about rev growth, right? Every, you know why? It's free. It's awesome. There's so many people there. Highlight this for these pain points. Highlight this for these audiences. Highlight this and why. And I think you kind of summarize that. If you're building all these materials and you're repurposing and you've got 20 objects that came out of this ebook, well, if no one knows how to use them, they're, you're in trouble, right? And, yeah. and so that, you, you, you counted that, so. Yeah. And on the inbound side, we do exactly what you just talked about there, which was like, what is it and how and why, which is, that is exactly the three fields that we have on every campaign that's in Salesforce that gets stamped on every inbound lead that comes in. And so it's like, okay, what did this person do? Why mm-hmm. does this actually matter to me? And how should I follow up with them? Mm-hmm. Those three things, right? And so we're always thinking about like always thinking about how do we enable the team to understand like the context of where what this person just did that they ended up in your in your world and then also like what's the best thing for you to go do to follow up with them how do you sound intelligent when you when you follow up with those with that person and and how do we give you more context yeah you know i i like to joke around about you know your templates are done you know, it's like if you if that they just are regardless of what your conversion rates are, they're they're yeah. done. And, and and if you're not there yet, it's it's a problem. Uh, and well, I I think what's interesting about what people are doing with templates right now, and 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 to be clear, we're an outreach shop, so I've got templates going. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that we are are doing really well, I think, or or are starting to do really well is really pulling snippets and so Mm -hmm. to add in that contextualization uh, and personalization and so like we don't really let anything go like nothing runs fully automated there's always an element of personalization to it but I'm, i'm trying to help our sdr team personalize as much as possible because like nobody wants your generic so hard yeah it's so hard to personalize at scale perfect with just automation but you can get far enough along and some people, you know, personalization can be, you know, but like a dumb template versus a personalized template. And, and no, that's that's right on. Uh, I've got some awesome questions, uh, by the way, you know, really amazing stuff. Also make sure anything we don't get to, we'll get to it, but I got some great ones. One of them is kind of funny, especially Kate, because it's you, is Kate keeps saying a lot of acronyms. What are all of these acronyms? Can you give us an acronym? An acronym? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, uh, what do we got, MQLs? MQL, marketing qualified lead. So whatever uh, meets your qual- criteria for what a qualified lead is. I've worked at, I don't know, too many companies, probably five or six now, and no, not a single one of them has always has had the same MQL criteria. And there's always some nuance to it, depending on who you're trying to sell to. But yeah, marketing qualified lead. A lead, that you're, a lead that you're willing to hand off to somebody so that they can be the judge, jury, and executioner on it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> marketing qualified lead is like, hey, you better move on this. And if there's non-activity, I'm coming to ask you why uh, on that one. SQL sales qualified lead typically is most places measure that as in they have a meeting booked. There's a meeting on the on the horn, but I've seen that one move around a little bit. Some people take a stage zero off and call that a, a stage zero opportunity and call that a sales qualified lead until it moves into a later stage. Some of those things move all around. Yep. PQL is one, I don't know if we said it, but that's product qualified lead. Uh, how do you, how does Drift think about PQLs? So we actually have, so we think about them as we have an offer for to sign up for a free account for Drift, a uh, little 
a little uh, plug there, but you can sign up for a free account. That's the next slide. <laughs> yeah. you, can, you can sign up for a free account there, and that's what we would call a product qualified lead. If you have a trial motion, I've seen tons of people call that a product qualified lead. If you get a freemium motion in any way, lots of people call that a PQL. Also, some people just call trials trials, either way. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. We have a, all of those definitions internally. We like to see someone take a few steps inside their free month of Market Meets Pro to be able to say, yes, they clearly get it. They clearly have these games. They weren't just coming in to kick the tires. Um, yeah, I see past life, we used to call that a wow moment. So there were three key wow moments within a product that we had to get somebody to and we knew with each one, they were exponentially more likely to convert to a paid customer. I call them aha moments. And we've got, yeah. we've got five aha moments that's basically it. different levels of maturity, but no, it's always good to be on the same wavelength. ICPs, I think I said this one, right? Ideal customer profile, yeah. So ICPs, so again, those have been kind of all different and typically really aligned to market and qualified lead. Market and qualified lead typically is so an ICP is like your ideal customer profile. It's the, the factors of, of an account that you know you're exponentially uh, more likely to be able to sell into and to be able to have as a successful customer uh, mm -hmm. on the other end so that you're retaining them, right? And, and I think about that as like, what industries do you sell into? What company sizes do you sell into? Are you an SMB? type company or are you uh, an enterprise type company, right? Like wh where are you most successful? Those types of things. What other tech do they have to have in play, right? Do they need to have marketing automation in play for you to be successful there or not? I think all of those things. Yeah, nice. I think that was a good breakdown of some of those. One question received is, what are the signals that a page is ready to be repurposed? I have a few things to think about there, but what, what do you think? What are the things you should look for if you were just doing a content inventory or audit, which ones should you start with? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. I would repurpose anything that I, I'd go probably through your highest traffic content. Mm -hmm. We're saying pages. I'm, I'm assuming this person's thinking about content, but I would go through your highest traffic, highest consumed content and think about how many more, how much more juice can I get out of this lemon? So how can I how can I make this a video? How can I make this an audio file? How can I do a podcast? How can I, how can I use this in my next speaking opportunity? How am I creating an ebook? Sh also, should should I create a second edition of the ebook? Is this ebook kind of outdated and doesn't need a refresh? And then do it all over again. Wow, that's like the combination of drift and market news right now. The answer to that question. Yeah, exactly. It's that where did you do one landing page for one material in the past? So you invested a lot of money and you didn't get the bang for the buck. I love that. Maybe something that was really targeted for one audience that could be in multiple. And two more kind of market muse answers to there would be like, where do you have intent to mismatch? Like, where do you have traffic going to that page to potentially topics or, or keywords that don't match the page? Well, mm -hmm. that's immediate repurposing. Where have you not updated content to match today's intent? So the mm. world changed. Maybe maybe you wrote the guide to natural language generation two years ago. Guess what? That thing is out of date. Yeah. <laughs> Without a date a year ago, and it's still generating traffic. So those are four more things to think about. All right, cool. We got some more. These are great questions coming in. All right, Kate keeps talking about offers. What does she mean by that? Yeah, I think of offers as anything that gets somebody to take an action, right? Mm -hmm. So. I think about offers in the realm of ebooks, webinars, potentially even podcasts, right? If you can get somebody to listen, a video, if you get somebody to watch it and like any asset that you like a trot, taking a trial, t signing up for a free account, any of those things, that's where I, that's what I'm really talking about when I'm, when I'm talking about offers, like what are those key offers that we can put in various channels? Right. So I'm always thinking about like, it's always about repurposing, right? And we're talking about repurpose, repurposing content, but on that, in that one content realm, I could get five offers and I can utilize five channels. That's 25 different things that are going to fill my funnel. Right. Yeah. And, and that's how you think about those things. Yeah. You got that like high lift hook and the low, low lift hook. Like if it's, if it's something that's like 
gonna you're gonna actually have to put effort in if they take on that call to action um, or one that's kind of automated so you could be thinking about offers as you know someone requested an entire you know audit of their site which is like oh gosh but it's that's a great signal or maybe just somebody somebody you know signed up to subscribe to the podcast so you know all those things i think that's yeah. a great, great commentary i think knowing the the marketing load all right um do you create set was another great question i we are looking at a sales enablement platform like hubspot or like sorry not this one like high spot uh, do you create separate content for sales enablement yeah i mean for sure we do i mean there's like decks in there and sales sheets and one pagers and mm -hmm. competitor stuff so there's definitely stuff that i would only ever hand over to the sales team but mm -hmm. there's also all of the stuff that i provide to our prospects and that they can get on our website every single day but it's just more context in there for for them on how to use it and and how to right yeah i like that you said it before was that like what is it on every time i wrote it down what is this why does it matter who should get it i thought those were you know or there was something else maybe in your salesforce campaigns you said yeah what is it why does it matter and how do i follow up how do i follow up exactly right i love that all right cool we've got a couple more questions thank you all for listening intently and asking these wonderful questions what advice would you give to a content marketing team of one <laughs> of how to repurpose but, I'm, the, I'm, I would, well, my, I'm by this presentation i do not know what to focus on <laughs> i love it yeah i know it's Sorry, I spilled out a lot of stuff and I know we've got some smaller teams in the mix here. My advice is number one, take a deep breath. Number two, I think it's, I was looking at this quote yesterday, which is like, your thoughts become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become uh, your, your character. I think I'm probably misquoting that, but what I would do is my number one thing as a content team is one, is every single thing that you are working on, like pause and think, and just think, how else can I use this? How else can I use it, right? I did spill a lot of, it's like podcasts, webinars, videos, blah, blah, blah. But all you have to do, right? If you go back to that quote why I shared it was like, if you're thinking about it, you will act on it. And if you act on it, it will become your habit. And then soon you won't have to think about it anymore. So the, the blog post you're writing today, just tell me one other way that you will go use it. The mm -hmm. ebook that you're going to publish next month, tell me one other way that you will go use it. And once you do the one, you'll be like, oh, that's easy. And then you start to build a process for replicating that one other way you'll use it. And then guess what? You can figure out the second other way you'll go use it. And then that, and then you'll build a process for that. And that will become more streamlined. And then you can add a third other way on how you'll use it. But like the the purpose of this whole conversation, I think, is like, this presentation is like made for you, right? Because you are a one person. And so I'm always th just thinking about how can I put a hundred calories in and get 1000 calories out, right? Of value out, right? It's like, it's like, I want you to eat protein all the time, not eat donuts, right? And so like, that's, that's the con, like if you can put a hundred calories in and get like a thousand ergs of energy out, like you're way better and you need to do this more than anybody else. And then soon your customers will be like, oh my God, their content team must be enormous. Well, no, it's actually one person, but he or she is just wildly efficient with how they, they spend their time. Yeah. I, I love that. A hundred of a thousand calorie or a hundred calories in a thousand units of output, a thousand units of energy out. It's just beautiful. I would say, you know, be selfish. It's a weird piece of advice in this dynamic, but you're one person. You got to be selfish. Do the yeah. things that you're do the things that you're good at. Maybe you're really good at giving interviews. So maybe you always record. You know, you call your five favorite industry experts. Maybe you got a call list, a, a snow chain. You call them up and interview them and talk to them about the piece you just wrote. Maybe you're really good at, you know, recording videos and you can hammer out a marathon session for two hours and record, you know, five minute nuggets, you know, like figure out the thing you're good at. So for me, it would never be making PowerPoint presentations because I hate that. It would never be actually sitting down and writing long form content. 
It would always be those types of conversational things. So like, think about what you're actually most efficient at already. And now think of all of your pages of content and somehow translate those things, translate them into the things you're good at. Cause you're going to, you'll start and you go, Oh, this is easy. This is fun. And then they'll, then they'll hire another marketer. <laughs> yeah. I love that idea, Jeff. That's good. Yeah, so cool. Well, we are just about to wrap. Like I mentioned, join the content strategy collective on Slack. You see the bit.ly there, CSCAMA. There's going to be a whole bunch of more questions coming in because I see a bunch of them already and we're not going to get to them here. Go try Drift for free. It's really free. You can use it. You can make it functional and useful during that evaluation process. As a customer, I sing the praises of Drift constantly. I'm actually kind of excited that Kate joined us today because I love Drift so much. But not just because it enables help desk to work. It really enables you to start thinking critically about content and start thinking critically about how conversational marketing can change your world. The, you know, the leader at Drift, David uh, Cancel, wrote a book about it. If you haven't seen that book, follow Kate at Adams 24 and or LinkedIn and follow Drift. Oh, they're amazing. And also get started in Market Muse for free. If you're not updating content on the reg, if you're not writing content that's equal to or better than your competitors every time, if you think you are doing keyword research by looking at Google AdWords Keyword Planner, you're not. Go check out Market Muse today. Get started. There's a one month evaluation of our pro offering. And then if you are kind of a mid-sized to small enterprise or enterprise uh, company, we'll probably hit you on Drift while you're in that pro promo and ask you if you wanna look at our premium offerings. <laughs> so there's another use case for Drift. Thanks, Kate, uh, for joining us. And I look forward to the AMA in a few minutes. Awesome. Jeff, thanks so much. All right, cheers. Thanks, y'all.